what I've uncovered over these years is having had all of these conversations and really in-depth conversations is I do get to really experience the humanity of these people and I feel connected and that's the other you know that brings a deeper level of awareness for me because I, I can no longer make up these lies about everybody's a scammer <laughs> Leave your false impressions at the door. It's time for Carl and Mike. All right, welcome to Carl and Mike's Threesomes with our special guest, Willie Baronet. Willie is Fellers? A, huh? Fellers? Hello, Fellers. how are you? I'm good. It's good to be are, here. Are you caffeinated up? I'm on the way. I'm on the way. <laughs> Fantastic. We Plus, are, you've got a fancy coffee you're waiting on. I'm waiting on one more fancy coffee. Yeah. Why did coffee get so fancy? Oh. Why did coffee get so fancy? I don't know. I don't, I'm not a big coffee drinker. I don't get it. You don't drink coffee? I drink it here. This That's is the it? one place I drink Seriously, coffee. you don't I drink it at home? I have one cup of coffee a week. It's like Carl and Mike. Really? Yeah. Don't you think that's odd? It is odd. I drink protein shakes in the morning. So... Coffee flavored protein shakes? Yeah, we have one of those, but I don't drink that. No. <laughs> so, when did I think it's you guys that made coffee famous? Not me. Huh? Uh. Your insatiable desire for coffee led to this the corner bakery. I think we can credit Starbucks with changing oh, yeah. a 25 cent cup of coffee to right. something that was just valued more. Which I think was more about the experience than it was just about the coffee. And that's mm-hmm. pretty brilliant, actually, on Starbucks. Because they did change a yeah. 25 cent, 50 cent cup of coffee. Indeed. And uh, So, uh, for the people who don't know who you are, I'll just give a little bio. Willie is an artist. He is um, a professor of creativity at SMU and uh, a homeless advocate with weareallhomeless.org. And uh, did I miss leave anything out? No, that's it. Right. I'm also a Cajun and the oldest of eight. There you Cajun, go. Cajun? Very Cajun. Oh, like yeah. straight up coon ass kind of like stuff? Like straight up 100%. Both my parents, everybody that I'm related to originated in South Louisiana. No way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so do some Cajun talk. <laughs> Man, what you want me to say? You want me to talk about crawfish or what? Yeah, whatever. That's very good. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. Raymond Poche and I used to talk Cajun all the time together. Baronet. Okay, we used now to... I get it. Yeah. The French part. I mean, do you... Uh, did you have an accent? I did. Or I think, you... you know, I've been in Dallas right. for 30 years, so I've lost it since I've been here. But I grew up with a very thick accent. Most of my siblings, if you talk to them now, yeah, you would hear... Still a pretty thick accent. Do they slide in and out of French? My grandparents spoke more French than English. No um, shit. So I grew up, yeah, watching them play bourre and yeah. drink Schlitz beer. And uh, yeah, it was Schlitz. just the thing. With a little salt poured into the can. Yeah, it was, it was old school. So you're a Boudin connection. I love Boudin. Oh, I, awesome. I love Boudin, yes. My daughter had a real good friend that was from Louisiana. And anybody that's got a heritage like that and a history like that, I'm kind of envious of because, you know, I yeah, you know, I can point to we came from this and that and the other, but it's no one central kind of a thing. And um, I think that's awesome to have that kind of heritage that you can look back on and say, hey, I'm part of that. Because I would have to say, and I'm sure you are. we're I'm al- half French Canadian. Yeah, but we're alley cats. You know, at some point right. you're just kind of an alley cat. You've been... Well, and, you know, over with this, that, and the just other. For the record, just... my mother says that uh, we're related to President Taft. Does that count? <laughs> That's <really>. awesome. <laughs> Who's the fattest president? <laughs> A lot of people don't know that about Taft. There you go. All right. But you know what I'm saying? I, I think I, that's a very cool deal. Well, and, you know, that part of South Louisiana is so unlike any other place in the country. Yeah, and really I, is. you know, growing up there, hearing the music, eating the food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all just normal to me, and it wasn't really till I moved away that I realized how special growing up there was. Yeah. And I also realized, wow, nobody else eats as well as I did growing up. No. So do you have crawfish boils? 
Uh, well, yeah, we still have one a year. With Mankind the Mankind Project has one. Yeah. Oh, okay. The Raymond Pochet Memorial Crawfish Boil. We're coming up in a yeah. couple of weeks. You should come. Okay. Yeah. It's so, uh, yeah, but, but you know, crawfish boils are pretty special events in South Louisiana. It's yeah. not like everyday not like yeah. rice Saturday and dinner. It's yeah. not like rice and gravy and no, 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 no. whatever yeah. and gumbo. and So a lot of the other stuff we ate was... When you really think about it, a lot of those dishes are designed to feed a lot of people yeah. because people didn't have much money. Yeah. And when they they had to stretch meals, so a gumbo could feed a bazillion people, you know. So they're not <laughs> doing a gumbo in a six-quart pan. They're, they're doing a gumbo. Not usually. Some, not usually. Huge Typically, ass. exactly. Typically, yeah. you make it so that it's going to last for several meals yeah. and it can feed a lot of people. Yeah. But boy, it's good. So you've got a big extended family then down there too. Yes, lots of nieces and nephews, and now great nieces and nephews. Um, most of my siblings are still down there. Yeah. My dad's still down there. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh. See, I think that's cool. Yeah. So what? Are you, what are you? What are you? You're a mutt. What, what yeah, nationalities mutt. are you mixed in? Oh, you know, English, uh, Indian, uh, Indian. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Feathers. I and, have uh, Iroquois, ten yeah. percent Iroquois, and you know Irish or Scottish or something. I don't know. That's why I'm saying it's just kind of a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Nothing I can really well, you're point Texan, to. So that kind of that. That, you, that's, that's your a different. Tribe. Your tribe but that's is a, Texan. That's yeah. Well, okay. See, yeah, but that's, I mean, who's prouder the, than Texans? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's your tribe. Forget yeah. the English Indian thing. Just, yeah, but sometimes these days it's not such a great thing to be. You know, <laughs> what are you saying? Texas is. Uh, Got a bad mark against it? Considered a little backwards? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. In these days and times? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Willie. No, I would say that's part of my drive. Right? Yeah. 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 Mm. See, I'm a Midwestern, so it's kind of very man- vanilla. Yeah. Place. yeah. Where there's lots of Lutherans, right? Uh, yes. I was in Iowa and Illinois. So uh, I grew up Catholic. So I'm about as white toast as you can get. Yeah, I guess Chicago would probably have a pretty huge Chicago, Catholic Polish, population. Um, yeah, really strong Polish population. The Polak jokes were big growing up. Uh, and then I was kind of, you know, I was really more of a Lutheran and that kind of thing. Hmm. Find Midwestern values that make this country great, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, the pig right. state. Yeah, the pig state. Yeah, well, we have that too, and we have the uh, second largest older population in Iowa. Why? The I don't what? Know. The second largest oldest population. Is older, Florida older? first? Florida, is, yeah. Florida wins, and then it's Iowa. So there's a lot of Buick Park Avenues in Iowa. You, you a few of those, yes. Lots of Buicks. We don't all hit the Park Avenue level of Buick. Yeah. So how long have y'all been doing this, by the way? Uh, it's about six months. Five months? Five and a half? Yeah, October. We, yeah, but we've been getting together for seven, seven years. Seven years. Yeah. So kind of seven doing years the same professionally, thing. five months, if you want to consider this professional. Now I wouldn't consider yeah. it professional. Well, we but try. Anyway, <laughs> well, let's get some professionalness going right now. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, well, yeah, That's you probably don't know you. this. We have, I have a journalism background and. and Michael went to a college that had a journalism class in it. So we can hit you with <laughs> He's some. trying to upgrade. He's a copywriter. You know. <laughs> I, I, no, I got pushed into copywriting because my journalism was too opinionated. Oh, yeah. According I to have the, students every semester who are journalism majors. Yes. They have to take some advertising classes. Right. So I end up getting a fair number of journalism majors. And I was politely asked to go take an advertising class. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of... Uh, I didn't do the who, what, when, where, and why. So, but I'm going to start off with a Fox News style question because, being a homeless advocate, I want to know. So, Willie, what do you have against people with homes? Let's see. Well, I have would. nothing against people with homes. In oh. fact, I wish more people had homes. Yeah. So How about us, that? Very good. Very good. <laughs> so, tell us about that because uh, you know homelessness. Um, I hope to talk about myself. I think the average person prefers to kind of look away from it and you decided to go the opposite direction kind of really pay attention to yeah it. how did that happen what? well I you know in the first time I started buying and collecting homeless signs was 1993 and 
truthfully, that's kind of when I first remember seeing people on the streets in Dallas holding signs. Right. And like you just said, I think I was like most people. I didn't really want to make eye contact. I struggled with, you know, do I give them money? Do I not? And I don't know where the idea to buy a sign came from, Mm -hmm. but I decided I was going to start buying signs. And it just so happened I was working with Tanya at the time. She and I were on our way to a meeting, and she happened to be driving, and I was saying, you know, I'm going to be buying signs. And we passed somebody up, and she actually bought the first sign. Really? Or at least she rolled the window down and started the negotiation. So you had you'd seen the homeless people, and then somehow a light clicked on and said, I'm going to, was it like I want to do some fair trans I'm going to give them money but we're going to I mean was it kind of like that yes what I didn't realize is that was going to be such a great way to start a conversation with right. them right all of a sudden now their demeanor changed a little bit because now we're negotiating a price right. and it was a chance for me to find out something about them and I'm also and I don't really want to downplay this but I love the actual signs mm-hmm. the artifacts themselves these yeah pieces of cardboard or paper or styrofoam or wood I mean I got a lot of signs that are made of different things I love them as just things and so there was a part of me that wanted to have those and in the back of my mind I was always thinking I'm going to do something and make an art project out of this or do something with these and I didn't really know what for a long time right and then uh, so when did you when did it formed this art project well I think it was forming when I didn't know it was forming because uh, I remember on the wall in my apartment I think I this was probably back when I had 40 or 50 signs so I hardly had any signs but I covered a wall and people would walk in and see it and I could just if I would have really been paying attention I would have realized that's all I need to do all I need to do is put them somewhere where people can experience them so, but it wasn't till grad school. I went back to grad school in 2008, and it was while I was there that this all really started to take shape, and I got really serious about it and started right. doing a variety of projects with them. And so last year, you really took it to another level, uh, going yes. on a road trip across the country to buy science. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it started in... 2012, I did a TEDx talk about this project. In fact, Michael was telling me uh, this yeah, morning he, that night. he just listened to it. And it was in that, years behind. in that TEDx talk is the first time that I said, you know, I want to travel across the USA and buy signs. And, wow. and then I realized, you know, I had said this and it was on the Internet, so I probably should do it. And a couple of years later, me and a buddy of mine, Tim Chumley, started to plan for this I called him up and I said hey man uh, I'm doing this thing and I need somebody to come document it and come with me and he said all right I'll go so we started planning the trip in it's probably in the spring of last year and did actually even earlier than that because we did a Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign in April and May. So I think we actually started the fall before that, the beginnings of planning the trip. Then we did raise the money for the trip, and we took the trip from July 1st through July 31st, beginning in Seattle, going all the way down to San Diego, and ending in New York City. Wow. 24 cities. Road trip. In That's 31 a days. Road trip. That was serious road trip. And how many signs did you collect along the way? Almost 300. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, That's pretty cool. Almost 300. We were also because we were do we you know in this process, we decided we were going to do a feature length documentary, mainly because one of the guys who contributed to this, a friend of mine named David Kiger, said, "I will contribute a sizable amount if you'll do a feature length documentary." And we said, "All right." So then it became four people traveling across the country. Right. Oh, you had to have a crew. We had to have more cameras two more shooters and so four of us in two rented cars uh, made the trip but it was uh because of that we were doing these pretty long interviews too Mm -hmm. we were interviewing 
we interviewed well over 100 people that I bought signs from. Right. And sometimes for 30, 45 minutes. Wow. So you, you had been doing the signs for 20 years. Did, in that one month period, did, did you gain new insight or did you notice certain parts of the country was oh, how, yeah. how they were dealt with or treated? Yeah, a number of things. I think that part of it was I, I got to have these really long conversations where before... You know, yeah. when you're at an intersection, I would maybe have a minute or 30 seconds. And so this was a chance to have these really long conversations. So it really broadened my connection with a lot of people. And I really got to hear deep stories, longer stories about what brought them there. And, you know, a little bit more about their experience of being on the street. Right. And... The other thing, so you asked about insights about the cities, but there were definitely some patterns that, you know, the cities that are generally friendlier to the homeless population, Seattle, San Francisco, L.A., um, Portland, some of, yeah, Portland, those places tended to have bigger signs, more creative signs, mm -hmm. because they weren't illegal. And then there were some cities where it's illegal to hold up a sign, so those signs tended to be smaller. What part of the country is that? Dallas, for Texas. one. Really? Um, oh, you're kidding. It's against the law here to do that. Yeah, the technically it is. And I've witnessed a fair number of homeless people getting tickets and whatnot by the cops. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of they issue them a on, ticket. Yeah, they were they were like right the tickets. homeless people are going to be able to pay the fine. Exactly. I mean, do, it is. Do they take their sign too? Uh, some of them. There was an article. I get sent lots of articles, you know, about homelessness from people, and there was an article not long ago about, and I'm blanking on what city this was, but the cops were having a contest who could take the most homeless signs away from homeless people. Have you interviewed any of the cops? Or the police, no. or, or the councils that pass these laws to find out no. what's the uh, interesting. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there right now. There are. You may have heard. I think in in Utah they have passed some legislation of where they're actually giving homes to the homeless, and it turns yeah. out it's the most effective and least expensive way to deal with the problem, to actually give them and homes. Why is it the least expensive? What is the cost to the city? Well, the the cost of providing them a home, and I don't want to spout numbers that I don't remember, but was I want to say it was like 30% less than the cost to a community to provide health care and law enforcement and all the other things that happen that yes. aren't. Right. giving them a home it's it's pretty fascinating and i'm again i'm not a researcher but this it's just is in utah it, well it's no it's now spreading to a number of cities and yeah, at the I've same heard. time there are other cities and you may have heard about the 90 year old priest in florida yeah, got arrested. who got arrested for feeding the homeless yeah. so the oh, other shit. side of kidding me. we can't get more <laughs> no more uh, anti uh, biblical I mean, it doesn't surprise me that something like that would start in Utah. I mean, Mormons have a pretty strong history of taking care of people and, and being good about it. I didn't it. know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I don't that. know that this was driven by Mormons or anything, but I remember the first time I heard about it, I think it was in Utah. Probably not Baptist, though, <clears throat> Utah. I want to, because I have to admit, um, for me, with the homeless, and I think I'm fairly average on that, and I'm not proud of it, but, I mean, I didn't... I didn't, you know, when I come up and someone's homeless, I'm looking away, you know, previous to actually the work that you did. And, and, I'm, and I was thinking about that. Why, why, where did that come from? And, and I remember when I was in my 20s, because I, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's, I think it's, um, for me anyway, you know, somebody told me that, the, you know, the homeless on the corner, that, that that's a racket, they're a business, and they go out there, they do the signs. And they trade off, and, and so you were just contributing. This was the story that I was talking. You know, I was just contributing to people that were just ripping us off. I would say that's the same story I heard. Yeah, so out. I think, and so I'm. And know, I, I, I don't know. This, this is an urban myth. Did you myth. ever hear a Does story come like out that? of the? Of course. Yeah. yeah. So I think we all hear that story. And and so I bought into you know that became my rationale for not like dealing with that. Yeah. And I, I wonder. I mean, is that this has come out of the psyche of 
the public as a way to rationalize marginalizing these people. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. I think it does. And so it's like an urban myth. And, you know, just like we could sit here and we could talk about teachers. And, you know, there right. are mostly great teachers, and right. then there's a few bad apples. Mm-hmm. There's mostly great cops, but there's a few bad ones. Right. There's mostly great uh, accountants, I'm sure. And right. I'm sure there's some bad ones. Of course, there are some homeless guys out there or people posing as homeless guys. There are going to be uh, a Every handful. Group. Yes. And some are going to be nicer people than others. Many are struggling with mental illness, with PTSD, a lot of veterans that are on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, so you saw a lot of veterans? Yeah, yeah, uh, quite a few. I mean, I bought a, quite a few signs that uh, some of the veterans would put their military IDs right on their signs. And even though they would sell me the sign, they would take their ID back. And, oh, yeah. All right, sure. But, um, yeah, so... But I think it's a, a human instinct to want to make a story up that will satisfy, okay, this is true about all homeless people, and that's impossible. The, the truth is that, the, from in my experience, 99.9% of the people I've come across are in some real situation. They are not there perpetuating a scam. Right. And many of them have... Uh, addiction issues. Many of them, mm-hmm. like I said, are struggling with mental illness or uh, some just have had, you know, they might have had really bad circumstance come up and they have no safety net. Right. Not like you or me. I mean, you guys would let me sleep on your couch if I was homeless and I'd let you sleep on mine. Right. But there are people for whom there are no safety nets, no, yeah. their bridges are burnt, whatever. And I, I do think that's one reason people look away. And I'll even take myself on that. Because I think the average person is a couple of bad breaks where they could be in that situation. And they don't want to look at that because they're, they're afra- I'm afraid that, you know, especially when I was 30s or 20s, I'm afraid one or two bad breaks and I could be there. So I just don't want to look at it. I don't want to look at that fear. It's a fear. Right. You know, and, uh, and I think somehow uh, it's built up over time and so I really I think the work you're doing with this to kind of to well, bring to humanize because I think they, they got lost in this process well last week when we were talking about Willie coming I told you about I had, it, it was a rainy day and I'd been doing some work at the house the rain stopped so I go to Home Depot I was in a hurry I went in got the stuff and was, as, just as I was coming back out it started raining again and there was a guy standing there that wanted, and he, he was real nice, real polite. He said, sir, do you, is there any work that I can help you do at, at home? He says, I'm, I'm currently homeless. I'm from Natchez, which, you know, my family is from Jackson. And uh, I said, no, there's really not. And he goes, do you, do you have any kind of, you know, money or anything you can help me with? And I, I lied. And I said, no, I just have a debit card. So why do we do that? I don't know, you know, because we were talking about that, and I thought part of it was there was an element of surprise getting hit. I mean, literally, as I walked out the door. Uh, part of it is for me. I don't know. I think it is an uncomfortable. It's a very uncomfortable thing, thinking that you could be in that position or. Yeah, I don't know because. But it, it, it's like, I'm, a, it's I'm like a blind spot I have with that, and I'm really struggling. Because, you know, I consider myself a decent person, and I don't think I've acted that decently. I haven't connected with homeless. Well, I, yeah. I still, you know, there are times I still feel uncomfortable, especially if it's in a parking lot situation and yeah. somebody approaches me. Because there are times where I'm not sure whether I believe what I'm hearing, mm-hmm. you know, in that situation. The people in the corner with signs is rarely, I, I don't experience that same thing. And I'm yeah. now very, very comfortable yeah. rolling the window down and and having a conversation. Yeah. And that doesn't really make me uncomfortable so the anymore. Location. Well, now, I, location, okay, I'll buy that because there's also, we got panhandled over in uh, Central Market parking lot one time. And it was by this lady and she had a, a child with her. Really? Yeah. Hmm. And I was, and, and that pissed me off. That pissed me off. I, I was thinking it's kind of a sympathy thing that she's yanking on. And again, but again, it, it could be that she was very genuine about what it was. She knew there was going to be people there in the parking lot. And, you know, at some point, the parking lot people came and shoot her away. But it, it, 
you have to rationalize. You, you're, my, this is my theory: is you have, you're rationalizing your behavior. You have to because you're acting pretty cold, or you know, you don't. You're ignoring or not looking away, or you don't want to deal with them. And so, in your mind, I think you have to rationalize why I'm why I'm acting. Well, I think in my in my own case, I would say I was so protecting. I was protecting myself, but you are rationalizing, you're rationalizing, so we quick. don't have yeah. to have the conversation we're having right now. Why right. do we really do that? Yeah. Now, part of part of it is is learned behaviors. You know, right. Part of it is having, buying into some rationalization that we heard. Yeah. That they're, from you know, parents and family and you know community whatever. And so I don't. There doesn't. So how do we all get? Yeah, so I think the way to get behind it, get past it, is A, it's just it's an awareness. It's taking a moment. Yeah, well, I, that's always the first step to change. You know, awareness is always the first step to change. And, you know, one of the things that I tell my housed friends mm-hmm. <laughs> um, is to also be, go easy on yourself. Mm-hmm. I think it's really easy to feel guilty about the choice I make and whether I choose to give someone money or not right. or even to make eye contact or right. not um, that's a choice that I make and it's easy to feel shame about that and what I believe personally is that when people do that to themselves and start to have that dialogue about you know I must be a shitty person or, right. or I'll make up a story about them so I don't right. feel bad about it that perpetuates a pattern that usually isn't so good. I mean, it's, I'm, for me, and there are times where I am in a hurry and I don't have time to stop and right. give money or buy the sign. Right. I try to always wave and, and smile yeah. because I, I do, they, I have learned that that's important to them. Right. I mean, really important to them. That they get acknowledged. Yeah, just as a human, human being. being. Sure. Mm-hmm. But, but if I choose to not stop and give right. money or to say no if someone asks me for money, what my job is, uh, what I've been struggling with and what I continue to struggle with is to be kind with myself. That in mm-hmm. this moment, this is the choice I'm making. Right. I want to be nice about it. I want to treat right. them as a, a dignified human being. Right. But it, I do get to choose whether I'm going to give them money or not. Sure. And what I've uncovered over these years is having had all of these conversations and really in-depth conversations is I do get to really experience the humanity of these people and I feel connected and that's the other you know that brings a deeper level of awareness for me because I I can no longer make up these lies about everybody's a scammer I you know I talked to a woman for 20 minutes in Chicago when we were on our cross-country trip her name was Poochie and she was there with her two granddaughters, who were three and five, maybe. And they were sitting there on the street. And she had a sign. And I went up and bought her sign from her. And we talked for a while. And she said, look, I'm raising these two girls. I don't know of another way to do this. Yeah. And I had respect for her. She was, uh-huh. she was powerful yeah, in what she was doing. Sure. And I don't know what happened to the girl's parents, mm-hmm. but... You know, their grandma, who was probably in her 40s, right. totally taking uh, control of that. And right. so I can no longer make up stories about homeless people. I, I've talked to too many, and I know, mm-hmm. and I've been to lots of shelters. I've mm-hmm. witnessed people that spend their lives doing work for those, uh, the people in those shelters. And mm-hmm. I am in awe of the work that they do. I mean, so many people devote their lives to helping and... Uh, so anyway, I, I just can no longer make up those stories. And but but this piece about being kind to myself, and I try yes. to encourage my friends to yes, to take a moment, connect, maybe even just wave or smile. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, uh, some of my female friends, they may feel afraid. They may not feel comfortable rolling their window down. Sure. Yeah, I get I that. that. Yeah. yeah. And so. I think they've got to take yeah. care of themselves. And, and what I encourage everybody to do is be nice to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, because the nicer you are to, and you know this, yes. the nicer you are to yourself, so, the more likely you're the nicer you're going to be to somebody else. Yeah. So exactly. that's, to me, part of this, too. That's really good. Absolutely. I think be nice to yourself around it. And waving a smile doesn't cost anything. 
And, and I, I talked to so many folks uh, when we were doing the cross-country trip that said, you know, I'd rather somebody tell me hello and smile at me than give me a dollar. Really? And wow. Well, yeah, That's, I, I totally get that. I mean, while we're sitting here talking, I'm thinking about, okay, what do I do when I drive up to an intersection, I stop, and there's somebody with a sign? Mm-hmm. I look away. I pretend that I'm changing the radio stations. Yeah. I maybe talk to the person next to me, which means I'm turning away from them. So the idea of, uh, of a wave and a high, I mean, makes perfect sense. But it also makes perfect sense for somebody. We ought to do that. You buy one, I'll buy one. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then just I'll buy to, them from just you. To have a just, conversation. And just to have the conversation so you're making that connection. And if everybody just did that, well, you I'll know, and, and it's you're still giving them the money, but there's a transaction involved there. And I think it's that, that's the thing that's intriguing to me. It's the, that transaction is what starts the conversation. It does, and and I've said this before. It makes them human again. You smile. You're talking to them. You're actually saying, "I want to do business with you. I want to do." I mean, I mean it's it's business, but it's not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I want to interact with you. Yes. Right. There was there were a couple of guys in Chicago. Also, in Chicago, there's a lot of people on yeah. the streets. But there were these two young guys that I talked to for a while about the different signs they had. Some were funny and some were serious, and they were talking about the psychology. And during the business day, they tended to use serious signs. At night, if they were around the clubs where young people were coming out, they used funnier signs. And those, they had a system of which signs worked better. And one of them also said, look, I can tell you when I don't make eye contact, if I keep my head down, I will make more money than if I look people in the eye. Because people Seriously. do not want to make they do not they want me looking at them. make more money if they do not look them in the eye. And so wow. what rings true for me about that is that ever since I've been buying signs, as soon as I say, hey, can I buy your sign, the dynamic shifts, and they begin... They, they Change are, your body they, language. Their body language shifts yeah. because now we're yeah. negotiating yeah. and yeah. we're having a conversation, and sometimes they're curious about, what do you want my sign for? Right. And so then we have a discussion about this project. And right. They're usually quicker to grasp it than most people. In some ways, they get this, oh, you're going to put signs in a place where people can't ignore them. And I'm like, yeah. yes. Exactly. And, and it's amazing how quickly yeah. they get it. And, of course, many of them who aren't, wouldn't consider themselves artists feel some uh, bit of pride about their sign being included in that. Interesting. It's, I've had some really amazing uh, conversations about the project, too. And So you've had these, I, I know uh, through Facebook I saw you, you were in New York recently, you did a, you had a gallery there where you had a showing. At, yeah, at NYU we did a, um, I did an installation right at the beginning of the year, and it was all of the signs from this cross-country trip. And almost in chronological order, I had the cities labeled on the wall, Seattle, all the way to New York, and the signs paralleled the names of the cities. So cool. And so you've got a documentary coming, Signs of Humanity? The, the documentary is going to be titled Signs of Humanity, unless we change it. Right. Um, and yeah, the editing process is underway, and we're still, you know, we shot a bunch of footage in New York for the opening, and... We're probably going to shoot a little more footage in Dallas in April because uh, it looks like I'm going to be doing a n- another TEDx talk uh, April 17th at SMU. Oh, fantastic. They have Founders Day weekend, and so they're doing a special edition uh, TEDx event there. And it'll be a chance for me to talk about the after part right. of this trip. And so we'll probably shoot some footage there and, you know, talk to some of the people who come. And, um, yeah, that's all just recent news, so we're trying to figure all this out. But it's likely we'll shoot a little more footage, and then we'll be editing for the next four to five months. Right. So maybe... Uh, September. September is Cross the your fingers. Mm-hmm. September. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question. Do you, uh, how has this whole process made you think differently about family and home? Has it? Is it? Has there been any kind of a evolution there? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so one of the questions that I asked 
all of the folks I interviewed, and pretty much I ask everybody, in fact, I'm going to ask you all in just a minute, but I asked them all, what does home mean to you? Mm -hmm. And I, of course, a lot of the folks that were with me, and I've spoken at some schools and stuff where they all turn the question back to me, what does home mean to you? And Mm -hmm. So I've been really wrestling with that myself. And it's it's a pretty long answer. I think there's some things that I'm very clear about, you know, like safety for me. Mm-hmm. When I feel safe, I feel at home. When I think of the smell of my mom's cooking, mm-hmm. I think of home. But I think there's bigger and, and longer answers to it as well that I'm probably still figuring out. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the answer to your question, is that this project has really, really caused me to look uh, deeply at that question, and, mm-hmm. and I think I'm still figuring it out. And it's going to be unique for every person, I would assume. It is. Yeah. It is. I think yeah. for some people, they do tie it to a place, and for some, it's very tied to family. Mm-hmm. For others, they've created the safety and family among their friends mm-hmm. because they didn't have it growing right. up, you know? I think different people all have a different way of looking at it. But it's really powerful to ask that question of yeah. the people on the streets and hear some of their answers. Yeah. What was the most telling answer from, or, or was there anything that was consistent? Not consistent, but you heard more often than not. Mm, I don't know that I would uh, that I heard something more often. I, there were a few answers that really stuck out. There was this young woman in Portland. And she was there with her dog. I found out later that her husband had died the previous year. Mm. But she was one of the most optimistic. She just came across as just full of life and smiled really Mm -hmm. big. And she kind of wrapped her arms around herself and said, you know, home for me is like a big, warm blanket. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way she said that just kind of hit me right in the gut. But I had a lot of people, the word safety came up. And I think for me, that's one of those words that I think about. And so I really pay attention when I hear it. Well, um, and there's mental safety and physical safety, which are to- two totally different kinds of... Right. And emotional safety. So right. I, I think for me, uh, to answer your question... Yeah, right? so Carl, yes. what does home mean to you? I think home means to me is home is where I'm most comfortable. Now, I work from home. Uh, obviously, family's tied with that. But I, I look at it as a, where I'm most comfortable. So I could be at home... You know, in a circle of men, a mankind project, if it's a real good connection. Um, it's where I feel most connected and feel most comfortable. Mm. Comfortable just to be who I am. I think that's what home means for me. You know, uh, I quoted Glinda, the good witch, yeah. Yeah. in The Wiz, <laughs> who said, when we know ourselves, we're always home. And, mm-hmm. I, and in a way, I hear that in your answer a yeah, little bit. Yeah, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Glinda. So... Michael, what what is home to me? What does home mean to you? I think it's always been about family and the people in my immediate family. We've always been a real close family. And um, there's something about having those close kind of connections that you can pick up the phone and call someone and talk about anything and everything. And... <laughs> At least with our family, everybody kind of knows what's going on. Everybody knows each other's business. And there's n- not a fear of that because there's uh, we gr- our family of origin, Kim and I have talked about this. Come to find out as I've gotten older, it's kind of unusual. We grew up in a family where we could argue and have discussions with our parents. But we were always valued for our opinions and never put down about them, and um, and always accepted, and all, and we always knew we were loved and valued, and that's I guess what family is to me. And then having that not just with the own family, but with extended friends, friendships. Right. And so it, I think it has more to do with with people like Carl was saying, you know, and that that could be. That could be anybody. So I don't know. I guess that's what I would have to say. It has more to do with family and friends and that kind of acceptance. Une- so, yeah, I mean, to me then, homeless not only is not having a physical home, 
but not having potentially not having the connection so that right. would be worse because you know another answer i heard you're kind of you're tapping into something else i heard a couple of people say look when you have a house that doesn't mean you have a home exactly no no and and there were people on the streets some of them said my home's right here hmm. but uh, a couple of them made the comment about a house ain't a home uh -uh. and i thought that was profound yeah yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And they were really clear about it. Really clear about it. Because because they had connection there. Well, and, you know, there are so another big discussion that we could have about uh, the folks on the streets. Some of them do not trust pe being right. in shelters. Some of them right. don't feel safe in shelters. Mm -hmm. and, and for some of them, it's because of their circle on the street. Maybe the other people they hang out with are sometimes pets because a lot of shelters won't allow animals. Um, thankfully, I think the bridge here does, uh, and there are some shelters that do, but in a lot of cities, there aren't any shelters that will allow pets. And so for some people, it's much more preferable. They would prefer to be on the street with their pet. dog or cat right. than they would in a place and, and have to give them, them up. And why don't they have the pet? I mean, well, really? and that's their family. Yeah. That pet is their family, and it's important. Absolutely. I mean, you, we, that's a connection. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's an interesting journey you've taken on that. And, uh, it, it, you know, I did not plan on this. If you'd have told me 20 yeah. years ago that I'd still be doing this, I would have thought you were nuts. Right. So it has, uh, and in some ways I feel more engaged and passionate about it now than ever. Sure. And it's almost as if, I think partially because of the momentum taking this trip across the country and that we got a lot of media attention over that trip and I was blown away by how many people struggle with what you guys were talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, this mm -hmm. feeling awkward and not mm -hmm. knowing what to do. That is something a lot of people deal with. And so I'm starting to realize that I think part of the reason this project is it resonates with people is because of that and like i said i still feel uncomfortable at times but for me this is a way to just be in it and it's really opened up some great conversations like this one yeah but it's you know it's no, a great it's a, a really conversation, conversation starter. Have, you know it has been for me so i want to you know everyone check out and we will have it in the show notes and links we are all homeless org for Willie's work and that how that project's unfolding. They can get all the information there. Yeah, and I, of course I'm going to take a selfie of the three of us that we'll post somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, sure. absolutely. I also want to talk a little bit about your creativity because you teach creativity. Yes. At SMU, I don't. I mean, uh, we didn't have creativity class at IS at, at Iowa you, State. How do you? Can you take anybody and teach them to be creative? Boy, yeah. yeah. This is a conversation we always have right around midterm exam when, mm -hmm, you know, yes. one of the questions on the midterm is always, can creativity be taught? And <clears throat> the short answer is yes. And what I mean by that is that there are techniques and practices and mm -hmm. habits that can contribute to mm -hmm. creativity. There are techniques that you can use alone or as a group mm -hmm. to enhance creativity yeah and those techniques can be taught and it's surprising that like with most things creativity is one of those stories that people make up about themselves i'm not creative right i'm I not that creative. all the time yeah. right yeah. i yeah. can't draw i can't yeah. take a photograph i can't blah 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 whatever mm -hmm. well all of that's horseshit for the most part yeah right and at the bigger level it's that Almost anything I can do that might be a creative pursuit, which drawing or singing mm -hmm. or whatever, there are things I could do to learn to do that better. Sure. I could practice it and become better and mm -hmm. more adept. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I'm ever going to draw like Picasso or mm -hmm. Matisse, but I can learn to draw better. Mm -hmm. But at a deeper level for me, it's not about the actual medium. It is about what creativity is about deep down which for me is about being willing to take risks mm -hmm. it's about being willing to speak truthfully and to look deeply to not avert your eyes I mean, there's a famous quote 
that I always forget who said it, but uh, being an artist means to never avert your eyes. There's something really profound in that statement about really? creativity. So I think a lot of what I'm teaching, first of all, is, and this it really ties into Mankind Project as well, but a lot of what I'm wanting my students to get is there is something inside of you that is worth saying and saying that in some format that yeah. needs to be mm -hmm. expressed that you may want to express. Mm -hmm. And it's only your own voices or your own self-talk that is going to keep you from doing that. Now, whether you do it in poetry or dance or music or drawing or painting or collecting homeless signs or whatever, right. it's all good. And my job in that class, which is called Introduction to Creativity, is really to get them engaged in the process and to realize that they can learn about looking at photographs and what makes a photograph good, what makes a photograph work in terms of contrast or lighting or composition. So there are things they can learn about all of these things, but at a much deeper level it's just, are you willing to take a risk? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to stand up in this class right now and say something or perform a poem? Step outside their comfort level. And, and at the beginning of every single class, the way I take attendance in this class is I give them a two to three minute creative assignment. Write a haiku about Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> I want you to draw a picture with your non-dominant hand of what you had for breakfast. Write a haiku about a bad so date. Every class. That's how every saying. class, this mm -hmm. happens. And right. I mean, they're like, and they have Freaking to do out. it right, right. away. Right. Can't and, think about and it. And then as soon as it's done, I usually play one song. And when the song's over, the, they have to stop. Then I'll have four or five of them stand up or share right. their poems. And it is amazing what happens in two to three minutes. Cool. Uh, is, I would have loved that class. See, the thing I like about it, it, probably at the end of the class, at the end of the semester, there are people that are standing up all the time that have just kind of flowered and opened up. Well, they also have to keep a blog throughout the semester, a creativity oh, blog. Really? Oh, really? So that's they are posting all kinds of stuff. And there are definitely people who I think awaken yeah. to their own creativity and that is exciting yeah people who maybe aren't yeah. going to pursue a creative career yeah. necessarily yeah. but they are at least going to be open to the creativity that's in them no, so i think great. that's a that's a huge and what you know why all schools don't do something like that because that has applications and all sorts of things whether that guy goes up or well and goes why, off and why do they does wait a business till? career there's still the creativity will show up in the way they present. It will show, you know, there's I mean, creativity the, seeps through everything. But why wait till college to I have know. a class like that? Well, I and agree. I mean, diseases are going to be cured because right. of creativity. Inventions will happen. The planet may get saved. Yeah. The way we consume energy might change. Exactly. Creativity has applications everywhere. It's mm -hmm. not the realm just of artists and writers and right. composers. It's everybody. Exactly. And... And it, for me, it comes from a place of feeling enough, I guess, security or whatever it is that will allow a person to take a risk, to fail, because failure is such an inherent part of creativity. Exactly. And we talk about that, too. And I was like, if you're not failing, right. then you're not doing something right. right. Yeah. But we'll talk about, you know not censoring themselves because that's yeah. another thing that can shut down creativity so I make sure to drop an F-bomb in the very first class and I'm like if your blog has it's okay you can F say fuck on us we've already been given an explicit kind of thing so you can say fuck fucking A alright so yeah if you <laughs> I guess we should have said that up front if you in the, I mean in the first yeah. day of class yeah. I tell them that same thing that if your blog is littered with the word fuck I don't care yeah. I want you to say it however you need to say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want you to take a risk. I try to get them throughout the semester. And, and every class, this is often the time when it's most silent. I will say, so who's done something creative since we last met? And usually I'll get four or five people to volunteer something they did. And sometimes it's I worked on our homecoming float for my sorority right. or, um, you know, I I redecorated my apartment, or I'm, I, I cooked a meal and I tried something different. No, when that's I was, cool. You know, that's cool. So it can be really simple things, but there's resistance. Sure. 
you know, it's but it's fun because I'll always have like choreographers in the class. There are people who are in film or mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. you know right. all these other right. disciplines. And oh, so, so I it's not the, just artists that are taking the classes. Oh, no, no, people no. that are taking it as a someone could take it as, as an art. art. As a, a fine art they, elective or something. Well, yeah. even people that are in the adver- yeah. if you're in the advertising school and it's you're going to be a, an account executive, yeah. you still have to take this oh, class. Oh, that's good. See, the, what, do you, what Willie's talking about falls into that uh, 80-20 thing. Yeah. That, that whole theory, because he's talking about getting them out of that 80-20. Yeah, what was so for people that, um, uh, Pareto, the principle of 80-20, the people will do, uh, like your clothes, you wear... Twenty uh, percent of your clothes, eighty percent, eighty percent of the time. We're For me, it's to, like three percent of my clothes, eighty yeah. percent of the yeah. time. But yes, <laughs> people are go to the familiar. You know, you go to the same restaurants. They order the same thing off the menus. Right. Yeah. Yes, they talk to the same people. So there's comfort the in the familiarity. And creative is is getting out of the comfort and out of the familiarity. Right. Uh, which is a good thing. I think just if we could just teach people to, you know, to, to not say I'm not creative anymore out of it. I think would be, a, what would that impact be for society? It would be huge, right? I do think that's one of the, you know, when I read my students' um, comments and reviews at the end of the right. semester and I get to hear what they thought of the class, so many of them mention that one thing, and that is, is a very satisfying thing to hear, that yeah. they realized that I am creative. Right. Doesn't mean they are Picasso. It doesn't mean right. they are. I think that's what happens. Yes. Creative equals, uh, you know, famous and and financially acknowledged. Uh, you got to you got to be Steven Spielberg or Martin Scorsese. Yeah. And do you then use those quotes to market the class? Um, do you even I haven't really. I have uh, posted some every once in a while because they really are mm-hmm. gratifying to mm-hmm. to hear. But. So could um, someone in accounting at SMU take that class as an elective? I guess they would take it as an elective. Does that ever happen? Or I have definitely had business majors take the class. So that would be they, good. They've recently opened it up so that you don't have to be an advertising major good. or minor. Oh, that's yeah. good. I think that's important. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. I'd love to see creativity taught. Um, Engineers. Would be everywhere. everywhere. For everyone. Yeah. Because you're right. The new diseases are the these are going to be cured, inventions are going to be, all that, create, all change is right. born out of creativity. Yeah. Thinking different about a problem or something that we've become very familiar and comfortable with. Well, you know, last semester for the first time I taught a class called Creativity as Problem Solving, mm-hmm. and it was a graduate class. So I was with students who were, for the most part, not on the creative track in advertising. Most of them were getting a, a master's in advertising, but to do uh, strategy research and other stuff like that. But they had a semester-long project where they had to identify a problem, typically a societal problem. Some of them worked on how we can deal with uh, uh, s- sexual abuse, but more specifically uh like date rape and stuff like that, how we can find solutions for stuff like that. Another one did a traffic problems in Beijing. Mm. She was from Beijing, and she said, that's, that's the problem I want to solve. But the semester was about them using these creative techniques, right. mind mapping and brainstorming and just whatever processes might help generate the solution. And coming up with a... It was more about the process because I said you were likely not going to solve some of these things, but it was about documenting that process, you know, identifying the problem well, doing research, and then allowing yourself to really unfed in an unfettered way, just come up with ideas Mm -hmm. and see what kind of crazy solutions might come out of that. Cool. We need more crazy solutions. Uh, Indeed. (laughs) The problems mount as we speak. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about just what's been going on in the world over the last couple of minutes here, like we do in normal Carl and Mike. Well, Not you have normal a, Carl and Mike? Well, so yeah. we're talking about, like, OU? Politics, sex, religion. OU. <laughs> OU? Jeez. Uh, oh, the racist video? Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, I think uh, societies, society, the media, uh, the, the president of Oklahoma, uh, it's been very swift and clear on that. Actually, mm-hmm. I was I was given some. I felt I 
felt that was the first time I had really seen, you know, okay, boom, you know, this is unacceptable and we're not dealing with this mm -hmm. in a very clear, quick way. So I was actually um, semi-heart, I mean, it was, you know, the fact that it happened was a, was a bad thing, but the reaction to it across the board, I thought it's been, it's given me some hope around that. Some, yeah. Some. Now I, we have I, a different take. Well, I, I, to me, it's evidence of how much repressed racism is oh, around, yeah. and it, it breaks my heart. I was actually at the uh, YMCA working out, and the TVs were on, and they were showing the video, and you know, mm -hmm. with the uh, subtitles and whatnot. Right. And I was working out, and there were several African American guys with me, and man, they, some of them were reacting, some were just not saying anything, and I just was, my heart was really heavy in that moment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> some of it just feeling shame for my own, you know, background and realizing that, man, as a country, we have a lot of learning to do, oh, and a lot a of growing yeah. to do. Yeah, and it's, you know, the, oh. the thing that came up for me on that was and they had a sign out in front of this kids. Bigotry is learned. This, you're not born bigot. You may be born into a racist family, and you pick that up. Right. And that's typically right. where that happens. So when this stuff happened with these kids, I'm, I'm sitting there going, those kids learned that somewhere. Sure. You know, because well, old... we've talked about this before. You know, I, my side of the family, then from East Texas and Mississippi, Louisiana, um, you know what it is. You've heard it all your life. Oh, yeah. You've, you know how it changes. You know how the code talk goes. And so you know it's still there. And it's, we've been able to, Nina and I both both came from families like that, get as much of it out of us as we possibly can. I look at my kids and I go, I don't see any of it in them. And that was my real goal. Yeah. Is to try and get it out. But I, I don't know that everybody's got that same goal. But to have that goal, you've got to recognize it in yourself. You know? Yeah. And to see that it's there and not good. And that's what I see about this. And it's like you said, it's everywhere. You know, it's still everywhere. And, and they were talking about it today on, you know. It seems, yeah, Morning I know. Joe, and it was a big we, deal, a huge I, deal. Since we started this podcast, it seems like that's just, it keeps really popping up in the national consciousness with Ferguson. Uh, you know, this thing here, it's just, it's. So, again, I may be taking a positive look here, but it seems like it's bubbling up. You know, I think partially having Obama as president has brought it to the forefront more sure. so uh, yeah. than would be. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of it there. And it's it's like you got to puncture the wound and get the pus out, and the pus is pouring out all over the place. It was always there. Yeah. Uh, and now it's awareness is the first steps. So it gives me... Some, somewhat hope. I am disheartened that it's how prevalent it is. Yeah, and, and when I heard about this, and in the neighborhood that we were, there are a lot of kids that went to OU. So I kind of know the level of kids, at least from my experience in the neighborhood, that were going there. And SAEs, I asked Nita because Nita was involved with fraternities and sororities a little bit. She wasn't in either at school. But when we went in the 70s, it was not a thing. That was Vietnam. Being in a fraternity was not a thing. And she said, no, SAEs usually are, come from fairly wealthy families. Not always, but a lot of times they do. And I thought, those kids came from wealthy families. And sure enough, the two that they booted out so far, Highland Park and Jesuit. Yeah. You know, and it, so there wasn't a big surprise there. And the other part of it is... It, it ain't cheap to be in one of these things. So you got to not only be paying for school, but also paying for the extracurricular activities. So it's not going to be somebody that's just getting by, working, taking out school loans. It's going to be members more than likely. And it's just, it's horrible to see that. It's horrible to see that there. Because yeah. I know where those kids are going to wind, after they get through going to school, I know where they're going to wind up. They're going to be in positions of responsibility and authority, and they're going to take those kind of viewpoints sometimes with them. And it is, it's you not know, good. it's ironic that I'm going to say this, but I also get the most hope from seeing my students. And what I witness for most of my students mm -hmm. is that that way of thinking is slowly, but it is changing. And yeah. they don't have the same types of, you know, and, and I see it even with um, 
uh, topics like gay marriage. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, I'm just uh-huh. witnessing the students are baffled by it. And what that it's happening, or well, that, that it's even that, that, that it's, it's still issue. an issue. And and so I do get hope when I yeah. yeah I have a lot of hope with the young generation. Yeah, they are a lot smarter and wiser yeah. than a lot of people want to give them credit for, mm-hmm. but they see through it and. Not all of them, clearly. Well, and I, that's a th- I say, think some of these problems are a generational issue. Older people, more so than younger people, have these views. I think that was one of the things that was so disheartening about what happened at OU, is these kids were like 19, 20 yeah, years the, old. That's right. the part that's tragic. Yeah. If it was a 70-year-old guy. But we're also dealing with. That, that I'd you know, get. Uh, white, southern, Oklahoma. There's an element. I don't know. I mean, yeah, a, no, there is. I mean, yeah. Oklahoma, the legislator yesterday, the House of Oklahoma passed, passed, not brought up a bill, passed that marriages could only be done by clergy. So you can't, you can't oh, get a right? justice of the peace or a secular. You have Did to it get pass? a clergy. Yeah, it passed the House in Oklahoma. So you have to, you know, if it but goes through the law. Senate. No, it's not law. It has to go through the Senate. But it passed. It wasn't like some crazy guy over there came up with the bill. This was to get around the gay marriage thing. So to get around the gay marriage thing, they want to pass a law where only clergy can do marriages. You can only get married by the clergy. Oh, they're not going to roll over and go down without no, a fight. No, no. no. It's, uh, so, wow. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, that, that, that kind of thing, the, the gay marriage thing has happened real fast. Yeah. And I think it's going to be put to bed here no, in I, another few months. I was I reading an article about um, they were bringing in a uh, it was a right-wing organization, and they were bringing speakers to the kids, and they said, you know, to these speakers, one thing you can't talk about to these kids is gay marriage. If you talk gay marriage, you lose it. So I do think there's, there's a hope there uh, with that generation around that, mm-hmm. and, and hopefully racism as well. Um, but, you know, when I was 20 years old, I, I, I couldn't understand racism back then. Mm-hmm. I, unfortunately, I, I mean, I was already shifting my opinion, but I had grown up, you know, in mm-hmm. South Louisiana. Yeah. It was horrible, you know, and I was raised in that mm-hmm. environment, and it took me a while to get yeah. it. But when I was in college, and, um, and I saw this with some of my siblings, too, that I think there was a part of us in our own way. We started, I, I lived with a guy from Lebanon, and I had my brothers would bring their uh, black friends home for dinner and it was like we were gonna there was gonna be some challenge somehow and that was our way of doing it and my mom you know uh, may she rest in peace was she was probably more forward thinking than a lot of parents yeah and she really in her own way i think instilled in me that that was not right and but it was tough. I mean, growing well, up in there, it's that. just it's, yeah. You, you do get you do get some. I know uh, Zoe's friend from uh, Southern Louisiana. Her, Zoe's friend is gay, and her mom was having nothing to do with it. And wow. then when she got married and had a baby with her partner, her mother was still not having anything to do with it. She finally came around, but in the meantime, her brother married a black girl. So. This was really a problem for her. It was, mother. So what was worse for the mother than well, marrying the black yeah, they, person and, or the and gay? There was, there was some talk about that, and she was going, "Boy, this is going to be interesting." And I think her mom's starting to come around, mm-hmm. you know. But I think her dad, who was always kind of cool with everything, said, "You need to come around." I really, it's kind of what happened. Yeah. I think there's and lots so of there's, little things like that happening. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in the family accepted it by sure. any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I'm sure it's probably not. But uh, she still goes home, and, and it, it's a whole lot better now. It's, in fact, I don't know that it, I would say that it was fabulous, but it is better. And it is, it, it's, it, it's, it's hard for some people to make those jumps. It is. It really is hard for some people to make those jumps. But the, to watch it happen, that's, that's when it's kind of go. Oh, good. We're it's we're getting there. I know it's it's just always slowly. it's always so fucking slow. You know? But I think it's improving. I mean, the internet and the yes. fact that we communicate so quickly and we're exposed to stuff so quickly, mm-hmm. that I think may be helping to accelerate some of it. I, now I it's, think it's gonna accelerating. It also brings, I think, some of the darkness up quicker too. Yeah. And ah, see, 
Well, he's I not, agree. He's though. not just a straight up internet. Carl is uh, like a flag waver for the internet. It does bring up the darkness, I, but that's you got to bring up the darkness. Yeah, you can't to have light. one without the other. Yeah. And I'm I, I love the internet. I yeah. am a yeah. uh, very yeah, so. very very uh, excited about what I call the uh, democratizing nature of the internet. I do think it brings a what certain amount of the dark side of it, though. I, that's the price we pay. I mean, that is part of it. I, we have to be able to. You have to have both. And it's the same as in me. I mean, if I'm mm-hmm. not willing to look at the dark parts of me, mm-hmm. I, I can't sugarcoat that part and just. But think you try it's, once, you, once you see the dark parts, you try and minimize the dark parts, right? Well, I try to or heal it, embrace it. I embrace it. I heal it. I try to anyway. It's yeah. but it's not an yeah. easy thing. Let's look at this OU thing, right? Okay, yeah. they they learn that chant. The house mother was doing the chant three years ago. That chant existed for a long time. Okay, it's the internet. Only it's, three years. Well, At three least. years ago, the house mother. So I'm saying, but this went back thirty years. This you know was a chant. Like I, we had a chant in our not a racist chant, but we had a chant in our dorm uh, that had a bunch of bad words in it. But so this had been going on a long time. The internet, ten seconds on the internet mm-hmm. is all it took to bring that sucker to light, and that's mm-hmm. going to change. Uh, it's a lesson for those guys in that bus, and it's gonna, it's, it brings out, it shines light on something that had been in the darkness. So yeah. that's what the internet does, and then that's why things will move quicker, because the light gets shined. Uh, the 10 seconds on the bus may or may not have made it on the Walter Cronkite yeah. 30 years ago. Well, it, I mean, it does shine a light, but the, the other part of it that I also see is I see the cockroaches scrambling for the... And, know, and the cockroaches the have also the found their own little places in the world where they can insulate themselves, too. Yeah. That can happen as well. But ultimately, Michael, it comes down to, are you optimistic about the future? Or no, no, I'm optimistic about the future. All right. Well, let's end it on an optimistic note. You, you uh, want to do that? This rainbows, one unicorns. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no that's it. Go, well, that, yeah. that, any, anything <laughs> optimistic would be good. <laughs> Well, hey, man, thanks a lot for yeah. coming man, on, it's Carl. It's an and honor to join you guys. It was great. As always. Great to have you. Great to thank you for your work on shining the light on yeah. the situation mm. with uh, homeless people and creativity, man. I appreciate that, uh, man. Yeah. We're going to buy a sign. We're each going to well, buy a sign. Absolutely. Everybody ought to buy a sign. Just to start that conversation. If you don't do anything else, it's a fun experience, yeah. actually. Buy a sign. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And as I tell everyone, and I will say it again here, I will buy the sign from you. I'll pay you back for the sign you buy, up to twenty bucks. I'm not going above twenty bucks. So if twenty we, bucks the most you ever paid on a sign? No. no. See now, I've, if we had an I've audience of a couple hundred thousand, we could bankrupt his ass in a heartbeat. Yeah, there you go. But right now he's going to be <laughs> flush with cash. Yeah. <laughs> no, we'll get there. Yeah. So uh, everyone, check out uh, wearealllhomeless.org for Willie's work, carlandmike.net. Uh, for the show notes and links. And look up Willie's uh, TED Talks on... Yeah. TED Talk, Willie Baronet. Do that there Google thing. The Google? <laughs> the Google. The Google it? The Google it. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Peace. Yeah. Thanks for having me. No problem.